I'm Chris Berg. Thanks for joining us. Yesterday I had a chance to sit down with Senator John Hovland to discuss what's next for the gun control debate, the future of the FM diversion project, and what do the new U.S. geological survey numbers really mean for the future of North Dakota. We broke this inter interview into two parts for you, and in part one, Senator Hovland and I discussed what's next for the gun control debate right here in the U.S. Senate. Here's part one of my interview with Senator John Hovind. With me now, U.S. Senator from the great state of North Dakota, John Hovind. Senator Hovind, thanks for being here. Chris, good to be with you. Uh, you just got out of, obviously, Governor Guy's funeral. What's your yeah. fondest memory of Governor Guy? You know, I can remember as a kid growing up hearing about Governor Guy, and it always struck me that, that here was somebody really doing a good job for the state of North Dakota. And they say uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery, and I, I have to say that as governor, mm -hmm. I really tried to, to emulate uh, Governor Bill Guy in, in many ways. You voted no on the uh, mansion to me amendment. Why? You know, um, I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, and I really feel that it uh, would infringe on the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens. And I worked with others to put forward legislation that really deals with mental health and deals with criminals. And I think that's where the real problem lies, is trying to keep uh, people who are mentally ill from getting guns and making sure that we enforce the laws we have so that when criminals try to get guns, we're enforcing those laws rather than infringing uh, on the, the Second Amendment rights of our, our, our so law-abiding citizens. Let me ask you this specifically. Over 90% of the people, according to polls, supported the mansion to me amendment. I look at this and go, as a law-abiding citizen, how is it infringing upon my Second Amendment rights to get a background check at a gun show for an internet sale? First off, background checks are required at gun shows for any licensed dealers. So you're talking only about mm -hmm. individuals, and this extended well beyond uh, the, uh, the actual shows. It really went to sales between individuals. And as far as the Internet piece, uh, you're already required, if you sell over the Internet, interstate to have a background check, and intrastate is something that states deal with. So I think those are some of the maybe misperceptions uh, that were out there in regard to the legislation. And again, the other point is I worked with Senator Grassley, Senator Thune, and others, and we put forward a bipartisan bill, got nine Democrat mm -hmm. votes, that dealt with the real issue, which is trying to keep people who are mentally ill from getting guns, as well as enforcing uh, our laws when criminals try to get guns. So let me ask you this again, because you just said if it's over the internet, it's already happening, there's already gun show background checks. So the mansion to me amendment specifically, how does that infringe on my Second Amendment rights? Because it went to sales between individuals what, wherever you were. So when you're trying to sell to an individual, uh, uh, somebody you know or a friend, you would have had to, in essence, go to, to a, a dealer and turn uh, your gun over to them, have them do a, a check, and then try to sell the but, gun. But so it really, it really did infringe on the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens rather than focus on the real problem. But if I'm a law-abiding citizen, it still didn't stop me from getting a gun. If I'm a law-abiding citizen and I have want to buy a gun from you and we go to a gun dealer, they do the background check, it's not going to stop me from getting a gun. Right, but again, what's happening is that law-abiding uh, citizens are following the laws. They're making sure they do things right. That's not the issue. The, the real issue is when somebody who's mentally ill uh, gets a gun and we're not dealing with that right. mental illness issue, the mental health problem. And I think you'll see that uh, if legislation does come forward, it's going to focus on the mental health aspect, which is the real problem, as well as not enforcing the existing laws we have. We have criminals who are going in and trying to get a gun. We catch them through the background check system, and then they're not being prosecuted. So those are the things we really have to focus on if we want to truly address the problem. Senator McCain, Senator Schumer said this is definitely coming back, more gun legislation. Your bill, I thought, did address the problem, didn't get a lot of traction. Senator Heitkamp did vote for it. Does it get more traction the second go around? Well, we got 52 votes and we got nine Democrats, so it really was more bipartisan than the Manchin-Toomey bill. So but that yeah, seemed to get I mean, all the media I think, attention. And, and it deals with the real problem. So I think there's a chance that you'll see either that bill or another bill which was approved that dealt with mental health, I think that's what you're going to see move forward. And remember, whatever the Senate does, then ultimately it's going to have to go through the House too. So again, let's address the real issues and uh, respect the Second Amendment at the same time. Speaking of guns, a lot of people asking the questions about this. I want to get your answer. Why is Homeland Security stockpiling ammo? Why is the Social Security Administration buying hollow point bullets? 
I, I think that there is some confusion. They did make a bulk purchase. It was about a two-year supply. But, you know, some of the reports I've heard uh, are uh, indicate that the, the purchase was much larger than it was. So, again, I think it's a little bit an issue of getting the correct information. I think they purchased about a two-year supply and uh, not, not a, I can't remember what, what the, the story was, but it was much larger than that. Some people are saying it's to obviously buy up the ammo to increase the price so the average Joe can't buy ammo. You know, I don't think so. That's something we can look at and check into further. I don't think that's the case. But I think there has been a lot of people buying ammunition uh, because of the, the debate that's going on. And I think that's created some of the shortages that we see around the country. And quickly then, why would the Social Security Administration be buying hollow, hollow point bullets? My understanding is that it was just Homeland Security or ATF that was making the purchase. But again, that's something we may have to check. All right, let's move on. Be sure and stay with us. Part two of my interview with Senator Hovind is coming up as we discuss the future of the FM diversion project. What do the new U.S. Geological Survey numbers mean for North Dakota? And does Senator Hovind support Senator Heitkamp's internet sales bill? The answers to those questions and much more when we come back in just 60 seconds. And as always, be sure and join our conversation at 630pov.com. Now it's time for part two of my interview with Senator John Hovind, where we discuss the future of the FM diversion project. What do the numbers from the U.S. Geological Survey mean for the future of North Dakota? And does Senator Hovind support Senator Heitkamp's internet tax bill? Here's part two of my interview with Senator John Hovind. Of more North Dakota centric, HB 1020, the State Water Commission bill, mm -hmm. had some amendments put in it from Al Carlson. Those have thus or since been changed. First off, did Al Carlson's amendments, would they have really handcuffed you, Senator Heitkamp, Congressman Kramer, from getting the federal money the way it was previously written? If the amendment had been, and I think it was at one time, that all the funding for the diversion had to, federal funding, had to be secured up front before any state money could actually be used on the project. Yeah, that wouldn't have worked, because that's not how you fund projects. Now, the legislature modified that so that as we get federal funding, then state funding can go into the diversion at the same time. I believe we can work with that. Also. Um, the state dollars can be used for other aspects of the permanent flood protection in the Red River Valley. So not just Fargo, but the region. And we're funding those things federally as well. By that, I mean levees and dikes and home buyouts and those kind of things. So that's an ongoing effort. Those dollars can be used from both the state and the federal level. As far as diversion dollars, those come in as we secure uh, federal funding on the diversion. For the first time in four years, it's not a light item in President Obama's budget, yeah. meaning the diversion does that hinder your chance of bringing yeah, sure. home the federal dollars? Yeah, that was very unhelpful. I mean, we've been securing the PED money, which is project engineering and, des and design. That's been going on schedule. As a matter of fact, we just got that increased. I met with the president, made a big point of this, along with Senator Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota, <clears throat> who will be with me here tomorrow, and General Peabody, who's head of the Mississippi River Division. We're going to have them both here in Fargo uh, touring, and not only to see what we do in terms of preventing floods each year, but to get them focused on the permanent project and help. So short answer to your question is yes, that's a setback. We are going, when I get back next week, we are, are going to be on the floor getting authorization for the project, and then we've got to start working on the appropriation, the funding that goes with that authorization. Let me ask you this, um, hypothetically, I live in Hickson, Bakke, mm -hmm. I've got a family, I'm going to lose a home that's been with my family for generations. What do you say to me? more work needs to be done to make sure we address the issues uh, for the folks that live upstream. That work needs to be done and needs to continue, I should say, and, and, and more needs to be done. You and I were talking earlier, you said, you know, is this project going to happen? It's going to happen, but, you know, there will continue to be modifications in terms of what it looks like. It's not just a diversion, it's all these other things, home buyouts. Uh, there's already 14 miles of levee that have been built. There's a lot more mm -hmm. that we need to do I think you're going to see uh, evolution in terms of the, what the project looks like in its design, and yes, we have more to do to, to address the upstream. Is there a benefit, is there a way to begin to wean ourselves off of federal agencies? Look what happened to your, your home in Bismarck because of the way the Army Corps of Engineers managed water back in that day. Mm -hmm. Look what happened this year. Fargo spent millions of dollars wasted because the National Weather Service had this huge record flood crest and nothing happened. Is there? some way is there a benefit for us to maybe wean ourselves off these federal agencies well there's no question that we've got to find out what the what 
you know, improvements can be made so we get the best possible predictions. That's got to be an ongoing effort, no doubt. But the reality is we need permanent flood protection. We need to know that we can protect our people, whether it's here in the Red River Valley, whether it's Devil's Lake, whether it's, you know, anywhere in the state. Minot, you know, had a terrible flood. We need that permanent protection so we're not so dependent on those forecasts. Uh, U.S. Geological Survey, you asked them, Ken Salazar, to go, and hey, mm -hmm. I want to find out how much more recoverable oil is actually in the Bakken and the Three right. Forks. It's now doubled from 3.6 billion to about 7.4 billion barrels of recoverable oil. Here's my question for you. I want you to finish this sentence for me. With this new information from the USGS, in 2020, North Dakota will be? Well, more jobs, more people. Uh, we're already uh, the energy powerhouse for this country. This is really good news for our state. This is good news for our country. I believe we can be energy independent in America within five to seven years by just doing the things across this nation that we're doing right here in North Dakota. That means energy, that means jobs, that means we don't have to get our oil from the Middle East, and that's what Americans want. This is going to obviously be a huge boom continuing for North Dakota. Here's my question. How do we as the citizens of North Dakota use this new USGS survey to get more tax relief in the state? Well, right on. Look, the reason that I pushed to get this study done and got the commitment to do it is because, you know, we have to develop the infrastructure, public investment, roads, bridges, water, and all those things, but we also need to attract, attract private investment so that we build the housing and the stores and the restaurants and get all those things that go to quality of life. But as we grow this economy, see, the way that you get more revenue is not higher taxes. It is a growing economy, the bigger base, that's what <clears throat> generates the revenue. And so in our case here in North Dakota, because we are working to do it right, you've got our the, the legacy fund that's building up a permanent endowment for our state, meaning we can continue to bring down and lower taxes and become even more competitive as a state on a national scale. Maybe you can call some of our legislators and tell them that exactly. Because a lot of people in North Dakota are not happy. Tax has got to be part of it. Yeah, that's, that's I mean, I, I believe and certainly feel that we've got to see tax relief on an ongoing basis. I want to move on to another topic. As you know, obviously, a lot of life bills that were passed through the legislative session mm -hmm. uh, recently. President Obama was at a Planned Parenthood event. He had this comment to say about basically these life bills and what's happening here in North Dakota. I want to get your comments on okay. it. So the fact is, after decades of progress, there's still those who want to turn back the clock. The policy is more suited to the 1950s than the 21st century. And they've been involved in an orchestrated and historic effort to roll back basic rights when it comes to women's health. 42 states have introduced laws that would ban or severely limit access to a woman's right to choose. Laws that would make it harder for women to get the contraceptive care that they need. Laws that would cut off access to cancer screenings and end educational programs that help prevent teen pregnancy. In North Dakota, they just passed a law that outlaws, uh, outlaws your right to choose starting as early as six weeks, even if a woman's raped. Here's my question for you, Senator. How do you feel about the presidents in the North Dakotas going back to the 50s if you get these life bills? Look, I'm, I'm pro-life, and I think in this state we respect life. And, you know, I believe North Dakota knows how to do things right. And I, I couldn't be uh, prouder of our state and, and our citizens. Um, you know, we're just talking about how we're leading the way in so many ways in terms of energy development, economic growth, and all those things. But, you know, I think North Dakotans do respect life, and, and I think we are pro-life. And, and that's what you see. So let me ask you this. There's a lot of, uh, you know, rallies across the state here, stand up for women. What would you say to women via President Obama's comments that they really think, hey, we are moving back to the 50s? Well, look, we, we empower people whenever we can and however we can. And I think that's the right approach. But I think it comes with a respect for life. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's what you see in North Dakota. And look at, look at all the people that want to adopt. You know, look at uh, the loving families we have here in North Dakota. We believe in family, and so there are good options. And, and that's why I think we are a pro-life state and why, you know, we encourage people to find other avenues like adoption, uh, you know, if, if they have a, a situation where they need help. In your opinion, do you think these bills stick? Well, I, I think so. You know, we'll see what the courts do.
All right, I want to move on to one last thing. Senator Heitkamp's proposing the Marketplace Fairness Act, essentially an internet sales tax. Do you support it? Well, I do, but I'd like to see an exemption of $5 million. And, and I am concerned that the legislation is being put through without amendments that I think would really address uh, some of the things that I think could make it better legislation. In other words, we, it has to be fair. We want to make sure that for all businesses, we're treating them fair. But I always come from the approach of trying to reduce the, t uh, the tax burden. And so that's why I think there's some things we could do to make this legislation Like what specifically? Better. Provide a $5 million exemption for any business. Meaning if, if your business has less than $5 million in sales, then you wouldn't be required to collect that sales tax. Here's what I want to challenge you with, because I look at this and I go, what do you say to the single mom? I mean, this is one of the most regressive taxes out there, a sales tax. What do you say to the single mom that's budgeting, doing all the right mm -hmm. things, working her tail off, and they're going, yeah, now we're going to tax your internet buys as well. Right. That hurts her more than anybody. One, there is a million dollar exemption. So any business that has less than a million dollars in sales, those sales are exempted. And beyond that, we just need to continue to try to lower the tax burden in our state. And then again, it's about that fairness so that our retailers are more competitive and hopefully there are options then where there is less of a tax burden. Um, the other thing that? is I'd like to, I'd like if, if this legislation does move forward, I'd like to see that $5 million exemption. But how does that help the single mom? Well, again, we got to be fair, Chris. I mean, you know, if, if you're a business and you have to collect sales tax and I'm a business and I don't, that puts you at a real competitive disadvantage. So let's find ways to be fair and reduce the tax burden for both. That's what helps that single mom. Anything else you want to share that we didn't cover? Good to be with you. Appreciate it's great it. to be with you. I you appreciate know. your time very much. You Thanks bet, for coming Chris. back to the great Absolutely. state. Stay with us. We always appreciate your feedback and your thoughts, and obviously what Senator Hoban and I had to discuss. You can go to our website, 630pov.com. You can email us, text us, leave us a voicemail. We'll be right back.